Hello and welcome to another episode of Musings. I'm Amrita Ghosh from Lund University in Sweden. And I'm absolutely delighted today with a very special episode, welcoming Professor Mieke Ball from Amsterdam. Professor Mieke Ball is a world-renowned cultural critic, theorist, video artist, and curator. She has been professor at the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the co-founder of ASCA, the Amsterdam School of Cultural Analysis. She's the recipient of six honorary doctorates. Her work focuses on gender, migratory culture, psychoanalysis, and the critique of capitalism. Her 45 books, and the 45th one is coming soon in February 22, include a trilogy on political art, endless andness on abstraction, thinking in film, on video installation, both from 2013. Of What One Cannot Speak on Sculptor, 2010. Her early work comes together in a Mickey Ball Reader from 2006. In 2016, her work in Medias Res inside Melody Milani's Shadow Plays and Emma and Edward Looking Sideways, Loneliness and the Cinematic came out. Accompanying the exhibition she curated at the Monk Museum in 2017, which demonstrates her integrated approach to academic, artistic, and curatorial work. After 18 video documentaries on migratory culture, she began making what we will also talk about today as theoretical fictions. A Long History of Madness with Michelle williams Gemacher argues for a more humane treatment of psychosis that was exhibited in a site-specific version in the Freud Museum in London. Madame B, also with Gemacher, was combined with paintings by Edward Monk in the Monk Museum in Oslo 2017. Her later film, Reasonable Doubt, on René Descartes and Queen Christina, that I'm absolutely excited to talk about today, explores the social and audiovisual aspects of the process of thinking from 2016. She's currently exhibiting a 16 channel video work on Don Quixote, Tristus Figurus. And her latest work, It's About Time, Reflections on Urgency was produced in Poland, 2020. So as we can imagine, this podcast only scratches a very tiny surface of her vast oeuvre of writings, films, art installations, and ideas. A very warm welcome to you, Professor Mieke Ball. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me and an honor to be uh, you know, on your podcast. <laughs> well, honor is absolutely ours. We uh, in the New York area and in Calcutta have a huge following. Um, so I'm going to begin with a documentary film you made in 2007. It was titled Colony. And it focused on Bata shoes and their spreading of an empire, um, so to speak, in the early 20th century that gathered a worldwide following. And it also left a particular big imprint in India, specifically Calcutta. Bata Nagar was created in the outskirts of Calcutta in 1930s. And interestingly, growing up as a child in Calcutta in the 80s, I still remember my family buying Bata shoes, but I don't know if any one of us really understood that they were not Indian shoes per se. Bata Shoes Factory was founded in 1894 by Toma Bata in Czechoslovakia, and then the first factory in India was established in 1931. In India, they had their slogan, first to Bata, then to school. And they clearly aligned a better future with education and shoes for the then colonized Indian subcontinent. The introduction to a documentary film discusses this phenomenon of the Bada empire. And I quote from there, what remains then is the myth of a great giant surviving as an early instance of globalized entrepreneurship, but whose vision then went and perhaps still goes against the grain of contemporary globalization. Why do you think Bada's vision goes against the grain of globalization as we know today, when it can be argued it was really the emergence of what we have today? Uh, yeah, that's a great question because it goes, it goes in two directions. You can say on the one hand, it 
is it goes against contemporary capitalism because it was capitalist but it was not so exceedingly hysterically capitalist as today's uh, globalized culture tends to be. Uh, so in that sense, Bata was uh, more benevolent than, um, than the contemporary cynical situation. And this benevolence expresses itself in what they then called the colony. And we called the film Colony to express that double, uh, the <laughs> double uh, sense of, uh, you know, what happens, do we make progress, do we do better or do we do worse? And um, the, the thing that happened with the colony, in the colony as Sonia Bata called it in an interview I had with her, uh, the colony is a, a compound, a place where the Batas uh, created a place to live, a village for their employees. And they made it, uh, it was very hierarchical, you know, in the middle was the top, the, the directors and the, the managers and then around that the engineers and at the bottom were the workers so it was totally hierarchical at the same time there was a concern a care for the workers also with the uh, again the other side the idea was not to be good people to the workers but to be they were convinced that it would produce they would produce more if they had a good life and that is true too. So the interesting thing of this Bata and with the interviews we had uh, with the Batas and with other people, it was really interesting to to constantly feel that ambivalence and to, to constantly think, oh, you're being condescending. And at the same time, yes, you care. And those were the two sides of it. So if I say against the grain of contemporary capitalism, we have to see how contemporary globalized capitalism behaves. And then we hit the wall of uh, indifference and cynicism that I find more problematic than the patronizing, uh, condescending attitude of the Batas at the time. Does that answer your question? Yes, uh, and it's fascinating what you call an ambivalence in the capitalism itself. And in this series, you created this film Colony along with two other others, Becoming Vera and Elena, and you called the three of them migratory films. Can you explain to our viewers how uh, this and the other two films uh, become a part of what, what you call the migratory aesthetics and why are these migratory films? Yeah, that's that's also a, a very important issue because for me, the whole uh, culture of migration that we are facing today and that a lot of people have problems with and consider a crisis, a migratory crisis, for me it's not a crisis at all, it's an enrichment of Western cultures to see the traces of other people coming in and having different habits and different lives and different food and uh, clothes and, and hairdos and all that, it makes the culture simply richer. And so for me, migratory is not about the migrants, it's about how we live together with migrants and how the, uh, the traces of that uh, change of the arrival and the enrichment uh, by other people, how those traces make the cities, for example, more interesting and more uh, enticing to, to interact. So one of the things, for example, because I've made other films that I call migratory, one of them is Gloop, and that's a film, Gloop is the Arabic plural for heart, hearts, and it is used for the, the, sun, the content of the sunflower seeds that people eat after roasting them. And the whole film is, I think it's 40 minutes, I don't even know by heart, but that film is completely focused on the traces of what some people would call dirt, you know, these shells on the floors in the, in, in the streets. You can say that's dirty or disorderly, but you can also say it's a, a multi-sensual experience to walk and hear the cracking and feel feel under your shoes that you're walking on something that's not just the pavement to smell the 
order of the, uh, the globe being uh, roasted. But the most important thing is, of course, that it entices people to talk. And so they address people who they eat the seeds uh, and they say, what is this? Why do you do it? What, where does it come from? And all that. And then there is a conversation. And the shops where they sell these seeds in bags is also an, an attraction. And people come in and ask about it. How do you roast them? What do you do? And those are all connections. That is what the migratory culture needs so badly that we don't turn away because we see a woman with a headscarf, but that we talk and ask and, you know, and admit that we don't know everything and that what they can bring in new habits that we can be interested in. So in that sense, I call it migratory and migratory aesthetics. Okay, I take the uh, concept of aesthetics from uh, Baumgarten in the mid 18th century, who, uh, you know, he, he wrote 900 pages in Latin and I <laughs> admit that I have to abbreviate. <laughs> it's uh, about uh, sense-based binding. So it's about the senses and binding, connecting in public space. Those are the three elements, binding, on the basis of the senses in public space. Now, isn't that a beautiful definition of culture? So that's how I, uh, I got interested in calling it migratory aesthetics. I could have called it only migratory culture, which is the same thing, but you need to understand what I mean with the concept of culture. So this aesthetic vision of Baumgarten is, um, my guideline to uh, to you know have a sort of in in a nutshell a very small nutshell maybe a club <laughs> uh, is a, a, a conception of culture aesthetics is culture that is absolutely fascinating and um I, I want to turn to one of your writings in my next question um the book traveling concepts mm -hmm. and um what you say about this uh, living together and this coming together and of enrichment of cultures, you have a different kind of a perspective in this particular book about friendship and the concept of critical intimacy. Mm -hmm. And you talk about friendship as radical source to transgress and transcend borders and boundaries. Um, you also define friendship as knowledge production, and state how one learns from each other in the process in that space that then forms critical intimacies, which teaches. And we do forget the radical spaces of friendship, uh, what they can create in rethinking relations. Um, but how do you think, but do you think that critical intimacies can ignore these kinds of hierarchies that are embedded around us um, in terms of power, colonialism, race, and of course, thinking about my own work on Yeats and Tagore that started off with this flourishing friendship, but that was marred by external forces of colonialism. Please tell us about this notion of critical intimacy and what, according to you, um, are the limits of such radical friendships? Yeah, thank you. The, the, the concept of critical intimacy, I, I leave from the book by Gayatri Spivak, uh, that she published. Uh, sorry, there's an intervention here. <laughs> uh, the the Gayatri Spivak's book from, I think, 1999, uh, Critique of Postcolonial Reason, has her a, a chapter on, uh, or has developed that concept of critical intimacy. And the great idea that I think she brought forward was when discussing Kant, Kant was one of the bad boys, you know, of uh, uh, Enlightenment philosophy, and he uh, <laughs> he's always being trashed for promoting indifference, which is not true. I mean, these people are always maligned because people have short made shortcuts through the theory. And what what Spivak proposed and demonstrated in her her analysis of Kant is critical intimacy is 
um, intimacy is uh, going inside somebody's thought inside and really go with the flow of that thought but remain critical and in that sense and that's how we get to friendship in that sense friendship is different from passion from love which is a sort of a criticalist uh, abandon to uh, an emotion friendship remains critical and the the benefit for the other person is precisely that critical perspective and critical intimacy is uh, almost a contradiction you're critical and you're intimate and that is precisely what makes it so useful and beautiful and that of course there are always the limits that power constructs around its its bastion of uh, control that we cannot avoid but we can be as close as possible and I think that that what she did is what also Kaya Silverman did with her uh, study of, of Freud and Lacan. You go as close as possible. You see the importance of the thought. You go in and you become intimate with it. That is, you take the trouble and the time to really study it and not make these shortcuts into, uh, you know, with the simplifications. But then at some point, because you're intimate with it, you can say, okay, here, he goes wrong. And then that's when the criticism comes in. Spivak does it with Kant, uh, and Silverman does it with Freud and Lacan. And in both cases, I have a feeling that I've learned more from these uh, people than uh, from a lot of the surveys and overviews and, and uh, you know, biographies and all that because there is this going with the thought of the other that goes as far as possible until you hit a contradiction you say no this cannot be right and then you make the you deviate you turn the corner and that is critical intimacy now friendship is necessary for this about friendship, I've learned a lot from the Canadian philosopher Lorraine Code, uh, who uh, made a whole list of the differences between friendship and passion. And that I have also uh, worked into my uh, book on uh, traveling concepts. And that has been also very, very useful for me, uh, precisely because it was not sort of drastically opposed. It was not based on binary opposition. It's not that love and friendship are completely incompatible and contradictory, but friendship has advantages that allow the critical perspective to remain intact and to remain active. And that's why I, <clears throat> I propose that to follow that concept. My next question is um, about a different genre you've worked on um, that we talked about in the introduction, and that is theoretical fiction. Yes. And in 2015, you made the film Reasonable Doubt, in which you intersect fascinatingly two historical stories of two famous people, Rene Descartes and Swedish Queen Christina, who invited him to Sweden in 1649. Firstly, what made you choose this fascinating story to recreate the lives of the two historical figures. And what does a genre of theoretical fiction aim to do? And I'm thinking, how is it different from historical fiction per se? Oh yes, great question, because this is really key to my film work, uh, to my work in general, but to the film work especially. Now, the, the choice for Descartes, that's, that's, the film starts with that. I mean, I started working on the film not i had not really studied christina enough to have a clear perspective on her but the cart has been so maligned as uh, you know hyper rationalist cogito ergo sum which is completely misconstrued as if he's saying i can only exist if i think no he's saying if i think there must be an i a body the sum that does the thinking so he's not separating mind and body but on the contrary 
declaring the necessity of the one for the other. But that has been completely repressed because we are all post-Cartesian. That's the sort of unsufferable term that has made me do this project. Uh, unsufferable because we are never post. We, this whole post is such a lie. The, the simplest, uh, the simplest uh, case to show this is the, the term post-colonial. You cannot just shed colonialism. We are in the middle of it, and you know that. And so, the the whole post thinking I wanted to challenge and to to take away, take out of our thinking. So Descartes, for me, was a much more complex figure than what he's been made to stand for. He's not a hyper rationalist. He's trying to counter the old uh, superstitious culture with rationalism, but not to sever it completely, but to show how they need each other in a way. So I found his work really important. Also because the world today is so totally irrational, we need a little more rationality. And I think we could go back to Descartes and take him seriously and learn from him. So that's how that started. Now to, to make a film about a person, about thinking, I wanted to see if I could visualize thinking, if I could make an audiovisual demonstration of how thinking happens. And the, the agenda for that was that I'm convinced that thinking is not sitting alone in an armchair as an individual. Thinking is a social process. Even if you're sitting alone in your armchair, you still have all the knowledge and all the readings and all the conversations in the back of your mind. So thinking is social. You cannot do it alone. And for that, Christina came up as an example of someone who has had an impact in Descartes' life, especially at its, its end. But there's another woman, Elizabeth of Bohemia, who was also very important in his, in his life, and uh, he in her life. And so this became the whole story. Now, theoretical fiction, right? That's a fiction, that term comes from Sigmund Freud, uh, who d came up with it uh, really interestingly in a sort of defensive way when he was attacked for the, the fictional, the obvious fiction of uh, Totem and Taboo, where he talks about the sons who kill and eat their tyrannical father who never let them near uh, women. So the father had all the women and the sons had nothing, so they killed him and ate him and then they became you know, men. That, and, and people said, come on, that never happened. Of course, Freud, <laughs> Freud didn't say it happened. It was a fantasy that he needed to think through this difficult, problematic relation between fathers and sons that leads to what he later theorized as the Oedipus complex. And Oedipus is this Greek uh, myth that helped him also theorize that. So the Oedipus tragedy and this fiction of the, the sons who eat the father together allowed him to develop something that has been so incredibly important in our understanding of how society works. So a theoretical fiction is a fiction that helps through its fictionality, because that gives the, the liberty to, to speculate, helps us to understand very difficult, serious social problems, for example. And so I like that concept much better than historical fiction, because for historical fiction, I would have had to, it would have become a boring film, because they were not so exciting, these people. And so I had to, uh, to come up with a fiction that made my, uh, my thesis that thinking is social, plausible enough to accept it as an intellectual insight. And for that, I needed uh, to come up with uh, little anecdotes in the encounter between these two people that uh, would make it plausible. And what is so interesting is that um, when I, I have made an analysis afterwards of the film, I said, this comes from the documentation. This is my fiction. This is from the documentation. This is my fiction. And when you 
sort that out, the most implausible details come from the documentation. And the uh, things that you accept easily because they seem so normal come from my fiction. <laughs> so there's a reversal there between the knowledge and the, uh, and the fictionality, the fictionalization. And this is also, in addition to giving the demonstration of the social aspect of thinking, it's also an, a demonstration that uh, fiction is knowledge mm. or produces knowledge. And that there is no, it's not that fiction is outside of society and escape from society. No, it's part of society. In, in this kind of theoretical fiction, and I'm thinking about uh, the premise of the film, were you also trying to create a commentary on madness itself? Because these two are also very unnormative people, as you talk about in the introduction of the film, Queen Christina and the card. Was there the focus on madness as well in, in the film? Yeah, that, that is uh, what also made me uh, desire to make a film about them. I found Descartes so important as a thinker, but partly because he, he, did, he was also quite mad. And he, or you would maybe call it hysterical, he would have anger fits and, and you know, breakups with friends and feeling constantly betrayed. He was a bit paranoid. And, uh, and Christina also, they had some things in common. And this was important for me because the opposition between madness and reason is not reasonable. It is unreasonable to, to, to think that the intelligent people are always always reasonable and that uh, the mad are completely out of the game, you know. I think the mad have a lot to say that's important for us and the reasonable have a lot to learn from that. And so the fact that Descartes and Christina both had these crazy moments of uh, that, you know, the, as far as I can tell from the documentation, of course, uh, that for me was very important that madness can be just as fiction is part of reality madness is part of reason and there is there is a way in which reasonable people who are never mad who never have these fits of some unreasonable something would be the totally boring people who don't know life and so i think it makes total sense to to bring that out and I have a few scenes of, uh, of that in the film. Your 45th book is coming out soon in February next year. And it is titled Image Thinking, Art Making as Cultural Analysis. And in this book, one of the things you do is make a case against artistic research. Yes. And I'm quoting from the introduction um, to the book. I hope the book will make our colleagues to reconsider that hierarchical term artistic research, which requires of artists to be more intellectual without the counterpart, require intellectuals to be more creative. Is there really a binary divide between intellectual thought and creativity? Isn't one always foreshadowing the other in some way? And can you also yes. explain Sorry, no, go ahead. Um, could you explain how artistic research then is limited and what does the notion of image thinking mean in the con context of constructing creative ideas? So three questions really, um, binary of the intellectual and creativity, um, how artistic research is limited and the concept of image thinking. Yes, uh, that's for a lecture of a few hours, but I will try to be brief. Um, the, the, uh, I have no problem with the practice of artistic research, but with the concept and the requirements to artists to follow a certain order of th first doing research and then make the work, which is in fact a way of hierarchically 
selecting certain artists for the fellowships, for example, to do a PhD and others not. And that is not based on the quality of the art. Mm. So that is a problem. It is a hierarchical term because it is, uh, the, the artists have an obligation in order to become art teachers, they have to get a PhD. The artists have an obligation to follow protocols of intellectual writing and uh, the opposite doesn't happen. In, in a sense, the people who judge those works, who are the, uh, the jury of the PhDs, often don't know so much about art, not as much as the candidate. And, but they know about intellectual work. So if you drop the name Roland Barthes, you can, be, you can hold the student accountable to say, what do you mean? What have you read? What, what is he th saying? And all that. But the fact that you, that you put the burden on, this, on these art students only and not on the other side, on the, the so-called experts who judge this work, I find that very hierarchical and also a stultifying because the artistic uh, exuberance or the, you know, the, the sparks that come from a creative mind can be, you know, sort of dumped down and mitigated by the selections that happen on the basis of the intellectual work. I'm not saying that all these projects are wrong, not at all, and I hope to see a lot of it come to, to fruition. But it is also very, very problematic to put the burden on one side. If you want integration, and I think that's what this is about, if you want integration between intellectual and artistic work, it has to be more mutual and integrated and not in this hierarchical uh, uh, procedure which is always what happens when new rules and new concepts come about. So that is the problem. There's no binary opposition. I think we have all a level of intellect and a level of creativity, but it differently distributed among us. And that's fine. I don't think it's necessary. And I don't think I have had sometimes people commenting on my writing, saying that it was too creative. Well, I was, oh, I was totally honored and flattered by that crit criticism because that's, I like that. It still needs to be accountable intellectually. That doesn't, it's not a contradiction. Yeah. So, and on the other hand, of course, with the artwork, when I started to make artworks, I began to be more sensitive to that other side and to see how, uh, it is uh, very useful for my thinking. And now we got to your last question, to your third question. It is very useful for my thinking to, to make art intuitively, more or less. I start out intuitively. I have an idea and then I do this and then I do that. And, um, and then discover how much I learn from the process of making the art. And the revealing moment was when my first uh, somewhat longer uh, documentary, which is also a migratory film uh, called A Thousand and One Days, which is of course an allusion to the Arabic uh, traditional uh, literature, but it's also uh, the, the number of days more or less that this sans papier, this migrant without documentation, had to spend before he got his legal papers in France. This is how I started to make these films. Um, the, the, the beauty is that I had to enter a domestic sphere of people I would never have encountered on that level of intimacy uh, if I hadn't had this, this reason to do it because I was making a film. And I, I became guests, the whole team, the Cinema Suitcase team, we became guests at the wedding of the two people who actually conquered, vanquished the system by getting married after all, in spite of all the oppression and repression and refusals. 
they managed it and so they won the battle against bureaucracy and that was wonderful and we were enjoying ourselves and having pleasure with them and that intimacy with the people taught me so much more about contemporary migratory culture as i now call it than i would have learned from the books and from the library and the articles useful as they can be it is the the contact the actually lived contact that made it possible to understand really what was at stake in what we tend to dismiss in the West as an arranged marriage. And uh, this was an arranged marriage, but it was also not quite and not absolutely. And, you know, there were all sorts of sides to it that I would never have understood if I hadn't been inside the community. And so in that sense, I thought this is, this is helping me intellectually. But then the film was turned down by television because there was no explanatory voice over that explained the situation. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not speaking for them. They tell their own story. And so it, it would be totally inappropriate if I came with a story that explains the story. So I didn't do that. And then soon after that film was invited by a, a, an art exhibition in Berlin about masculinity. And I thought, hey, how interesting. Of course, I was happy and they made us come and we had, we had a, a wonderful time. But why this film on masculinity? And then I saw it, I watched it again. And so from the, the fact that it was framed as art, I learned more. And I saw these moments in the film that uh, were incredibly sort of counter uh, prejudice about Arab cultures. There was a moment that the, little, uh, the 14 year old daughter of the father of the bride uh, put the headscarf, took the, the headscarf of the neighbor who was sitting next to him and put it on her father's head, like a woman. Mm. And the, the key moment is that the father looks at the camera and smiles. That's all. But that is such a powerful moment that all our prejudices about masculinity and oppression of women by the scarf and all that, it all vanished in the face of the man endorsing the joke his daughter was making about his masculinity. And that was such a beautiful moment. So then I understood why this film was actually art making as cultural analysis, literally the subtitle of my uh, new book. So in the end, after all the other stuff I did, because I never stopped writing, people sometimes assumed that I was just tired of writing, so I made films, you've done enough, it's fine, you know, do, follow your hobby. It's not a hobby. <laughs> it's a better way of doing cultural analysis. And uh, I, I understood more and more about myself and my own intellectual development by looking back at the films. And thinking about it and analyzing them. And that's not a sort of self-indulgent, narcissistic, you know, navel staring exercise. It's really to understand on all levels what I was doing in this, in, in this making of the films. And so image thinking is that means that. And of course it doesn't always have to be image, but you can do other kinds of art and understand, but in this case, I called it image thinking to get around the, the problem of artistic research as a term. Thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. And I want to stay on the, on this topic of art itself. And, um, your work has often focused on art and its transformative potential to rethink, um, what's happening in the present towards a better future. And I'm also wondering if there is a fine line between art as this kind of propagandist art and transformative art, where is the fine line? And I'm interested how your concept of image thinking can help us recognize 
this transformative art. And from what you just said, it also seems that at the heart of it is also the spectator to create um, a reading, an ethicality of reading, and I'm here thinking of Spivak. So is, is the work really the responsibility of the spectator? Uh, this is maybe the most important question in general about art. What's the point of art? And uh, we have, um, we've had for, the, for a long time now, um, a lot of art that was combative, militant, mm. activist. And that is important. There is a beautiful book by uh, a guy called T. H. Dimas uh, on activist art that I have learned a lot from. And I think it is important to, to see how artists and artworks can make people uh, you know, go on the street and, and demand their political rights. That's activist art, fine. But it's also very close, and that's what the fine line that you were talking about, it's very close to propaganda. And then I go back to one of my philosophical heroes, Adorno, who said art that only wants to be art uh, ceases to, to have anything to say. But art that wants to be propaganda ceases to be art. Art that's pro that becomes really propaganda when you go to the, on the street and claim a certain right through art, it ceases to be art. And I always found that a fascinating uh, dilemma. And I have learned also in this in this uh, these 20 years that I've been making art, but also by studying the art of others, that uh, the, the importance of art is not so much to persuade, because that propagandistic aspect is also dominating and makes the, the, the spectator, in fact, passive uh, objects of persuasion. But it is more important to activate people to rethink their convictions and to get out of their stultified ideas or their self-evidences and obviousness. They think that we know what we are, we do this and we, we are on the right or on the left. But to rethink their positions and that art, that's why I'm now pleading for a transformation of activist art to activating art. And activating means that it, the, the spectator remains free to think what they want to think, because I don't want to dominate another people's brain. But the art shakes up the certainties that they might have and that shaking up is the activating and i think that is what art can do and to make it and i've done experiences in museums that are really laughable very f amusing to make people be shocked by something that um, they had not seen but that suddenly becomes problematic and and then they have this sort of they are taken aback, but I'm not saying you have to think this way. I leave them with it. And then they have to make up their mind. And that making up their mind and being compelled to do that, that's what art can do without being activist, but still being politically activating, relevant. Because I do want art to be to participate in the politics of, you know, the political culture that is all around us. And so this is what art can do. And activating art is the best, uh, I think it's the best term now to, uh, to, to offer an alternative to activist, which is about one issue. Thank you, Professor Minkevala. It is an absolute honor to listen to you today. Thank you. It was fun to talk with you. And your questions were very relevant for me and made me rethink everything again. <laughs>